So those who haven't uh, taken their seat yet at the back of the room, come and join the rest of us at the table. It's a great uh, privilege for me to welcome you to our February meeting. Uh, Nicholas Parker has been often described as a quintessential book person. Perhaps he was a doc ordained to be such, both by heredity and environment. It is most fitting that we are privileged this evening to have him as our speaker. For perhaps more than any other person, he exemplifies the art of the book in every respect. He grew up in a Cambridge University professor's son and a home containing over 15,000 books. One can only speculate whether there was room for any other playthings. No wonder that the Milne Winnie the Pooh family finally reached America. <laughs> But Barker was surrounded by books, and the University of Cambridge was his playpen. It was there that he first became enamored of printing, to such an extent that his father bought him his own printing press while he was still a child. He was labeled a voracious reader, a three-book-a-day child, and became an obsessive reader. Although we are fond of quoting Thomas Jefferson and his I cannot live without books. Nicholas Parker never had the chance to be without me. <laughs> and every aspect of it. After graduation from Oxford, he moved into the reading of books, and after that, into the sensual apparatus of a book, or book design and publishing, in what he appropriately termed the engine rooms of the publishing companies, such as Rupert Hart Davis, the Macmillan Company, the Oxford University Press, and others. But the complexion of his book world changed in 1976 when he was asked to become the first head of conservation at the British Library, the most frequently used library in the world, but with its more than 15 million volumes. It's one thing to conserve books, it's another to ensure the maintenance of books frequently used and circulated. At the present time, he uh, claims to be retired, but I think perhaps he may be a little busier than before he officially retired. He is uh, well known for being the editor of the well-known journal, The Book Collector. He is a consultant and has charge of many different library projects and organizations throughout not only Great Britain but also the United States and other countries. His own personal collection is described by him as being idiosyncratic. In his home, the books are everywhere. They are shelved in his rooms, his library, his study. They are shelved in his five children's bedrooms. They are shelved along the stairways. And yes, there are even shelves in the loo. Uh, I asked him about the kitchen, and apparently the kitchen is the only thing that is sacrosanct. There are no shelves in the kitchen. His books are the salvation of modern society to him, with our present obsession with technology. Most recently, he has won distinction in the field of the identification and the validation of important manuscripts and books. Fakes and Frauds, if you wish, and that is the title of a book recently published. Uh, I have a copy of it here if anyone would like to see it. No one could be a more fitting speaker than Nicholas Barker for this club, founded to memorialize and honor the first English printer, William Caxton. Please join me in welcoming him, Nicholas Barker. One little bit of information and one question. Um, the 
largest and most extensive possessor of the forgeries of T.J. Wise was one of the founders of, the, of the, this club, Mr. <laughs> John A. Squire. Now the question is, what on earth does the... Am I not coming across? Hi. Okay. What on earth does the Loyola University need a Gentile centre for? <laughs> <laughs> What I'm going to talk to you about is the book lecture, of which I have been the editor for 33 and a half years. It was founded in 1952, a bit before my time. Indeed, before book collectors as such had become an endangered species. Book collectors were to be found all over the place in those days. They came in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. There was the sixpenny barrel, barrow model, whose books were not suitable, remarkable for condition, but were all of them bargains. There was the my favorite author type, for whom the first word, first edition, was originally invented. The tuppence colored model, which specialized in color plate books. And there were others who lived on local topography, private press books, law books, travel and discovery. There were even, in those days, one or two novel creatures who were foraging in the virgin forests of economics and science. But most important of all was the great transatlantic collector, which had been driven back to its native habitat, or reservations, by the war, and was still rarely found in the Eastern Hemisphere. But whatever shape or size they came in, book collectors led a free, unfettered life. Systematic study of the species, the ringing of typical specimens by librarians, the threat of extinction by tax collectors, investors, and inflation, all this lay in the future. It was indeed hard to draw systematic lines between such distinct species as librarians and collectors, or professionals and amateurs, and they all tended to be lumped together under the generic heading of book lovers. Bibliophiles, a word tainted by the suspicion that it ought to be pronounced with a French accent, was something that you read but did not speak about. <laughs> with this in mind, you will have some idea of the constituency to which the first book collector was addressed nearly 30 years ago. Its title referred to a state of mind, a kind, a kind of interest, rather than a particular sort of person, something best conveyed by an apt parallel. There was, I hope there still is, a journal for the construction industry in England called The Muck Shifter and Earth Removing Chronicle. <laughs> if you think of the book collector in that light, you will have some idea of what it is about. It is not about how to collect first editions, though you will learn much about it, that in its pages. Nor how to tell the genuine article from fakes, nor how to buy cheap and sell dear, nor what it is worth. If this is all that interests you, there are other and better sources of information. The book collector will only offer you occasional help. What it does serve is that fraternity of book collectors in the sense that I have just described. There's always a distinction that is apt to be made between people who just read books and book collectors who collect them, admire their bindings or printing or just pat them, anything but read them. Now, I'm not going to go into all that now, not now, please, but I will say that you will not enjoy the book collector unless you're prepared to do both. I'm beginning to realize that I'm make, making it sound rather forbidding. Uh, sound not only rather prim and proper, uh, but, but positively off-putting. And so back for a moment to its early history. 
In fact, if you'll excuse a rather Irish turn of phrase, the first number of the book collector was not really its beginning at all. In fact, if you were to buy a set of back numbers, luck as not, you would find, before the first volume, which rather tiresomely is in a smaller format than its successors, another little bunch of man at magazines, mostly no thicker than pamphlets, under the title of the book handbook. If, you're vi if you were very lucky, you would find them already bound together. More often than not, they remain unbound because it is all but impossible to work out the order of the pages. Odd so sections pop up in later numbers, intended, but not described as such, as supplements to earlier numbers. Indexes of what? Appear separately or attached to issues to which they do not refer. <laughs> I still get despairing or infuriated letters about it. All this may be explained if I quote from a note which appears on page Roman 3, which follows a blank leaf following an index paginated 477 to 85. <laughs> I'm not sure where I and II are, which runs as follows. This volume was issued serially in nine parts. The first number of the book handbook appeared in February 1947 when there was not enough coal or electricity to work the printing machines. <laughs> some power was supplied by hand and some by means of a trailer pump which had been used to pump water into the fires caused by the Germans in their air raids. The first six parts were printed on rationed paper by the Broadwater Press of Willing Garden City. The other three parts, pages 129 to 176, 439 to 476, by Messrs. W.S. Cowell Limited of Ipswich. That characteristic statement of the pagination of parts 7 to 9 tells you something about the founder, a remarkable man who seldom stayed to finish what he had begun, called Reginald Horrocks. But it also tells you more about the con conditions in which not only books, but the staples of life, the other staples of life, I should say, like food and clothes, were rationed. The war-torn Britain of 50 years ago, which seems now so unimaginably remote. But with all that, the conditions of the book handbook are a recognizable mirror of what you'd find in the book collector today. I'm not going to describe them in any detail, but they range from medieval manuscripts to contemporary illustrations, from book binding to the Bay Psalm book. It contained a bibliography of that extraordinary 18th century novelist Robert Page, an exhaustive account of the 16th century book, French book collector Jacques Auguste de Tout, and a series of articles by the venerable Sidney Cockrell, who had started his career as secretary to William Morris's Chelmsford Press and ended as director of the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And he wrote on signed manuscripts in my collection. I particularly like an early article by Gilbert Faves, who was then the manager of Boyle's Rare Book Department, on a series of encounters with George Bernard Shaw in the course of buying books no longer wanted when Shaw was selling his London flat. There was inevitably a certain amount of confusion, and Faves concluded one letter with an apologetic, I'm afraid I might be in Mr. Shaw's bad books. He got a postcard by return. It simply said, Mr. Shaw has no bad books. <laughs> <laughs> the book handbook staggered on in various, in a very irregular intervals from 1947 to 1950, but in 1951, a change took place. This was due to the impact of the late Lord Kemsley, what then one of England's major newspaper magnates, owner in particular of the prestigious London Sunday Times, who had just embarked on a career, brief as it turned out, but heady, of what I can only call bibliophily. This embraced the collecting of books himself, on the one hand, and the establishment of, of publishing businesses, to which shortly afterwards a small printing shop was added, both bearing the same imprint, the Dropmore Press. Dropmore was Lord Kemsley's splendid country house. So, with a new enthusiasm and new funds, the book handbook entered a new existence with a new sense of order and method, and even a new editorial board drawn from Lord Kemsley's associates. It became a quarterly, 
to what was now called the second volume, duly achieved four numbers. But, but volume two was the last. Horrocks was the individualist who did not acclimatize to corporate life, even on this modest scale. Irreconcilable petty conflict resulted in the decision to close down the book handbook. This was, however, reckoning without the readers, who were determined that it should not die. A deputation of the most prominent and determined, among them Percy Muir, John Hayward, John Carter, and Ian Fleming, persuaded Lord Kensley to grant a reprieve. The terms were that they should undertake the management themselves. And this change of management indicated a change of title. And so, in 1952, the book handbook became the book collector. And, apart from this, there was very little change. <coughs> the format was preserved, and Sir Sidney Cockerell's articles on the manuscripts in his collection continued as if nothing had happened. At the end of the year, the page size was increased a distinct advantage when it came to reproducing things like title pages or bindings, which suffer by reduction. Since then, apart from the covers, of which more later, nothing much has changed about the layout and appearance of the book collector. But who were they, those authoritative enthusiasts who took over the book collector and gave it the character and quality that survived, ensured its survival? Through thick and thin, and my own editorship, I suppose, must be regarded as one of its thicker periods. Who were Carter, Muir, Fleming, and Hayward? Well, they were, I suppose, the heroes of my youth. And to explain that, I have to interject a few words of pure autobiography. And dear Dr. Kittle has stolen some of my lines, but you'll have to put up with that. <coughs> I was born, as you gathered, and brought up in Cambridge. We lived in a large house more or less full of books. I think it's actually nearer 20,000 than 15. Some were new, but quite a lot were old. My father, who was born in 1874, had been buying books all his life. And even the books he had bought new as a young man, man were now quite old. Besides, in his young day, old books were quite cheap. I still have his folio Euripides, printed in Baal in 1564, and it has the price he mark, had, that marked inside it. He paid eight shillings and sixpence, seven shillings cash. Those were the days when university booksellers were happy to give unlimited credit to young academics. At eight, at eight, eight shillings and sixpence, or seven shillings, it was a lot cheaper than the brand new Oxford classical text, which cost ten shillings and sixpence. But besides my father's old books, Cambridge had three other assets as, I, as far as I was concerned. A university library from which senior members of the university were allowed to borrow books. A university press, world famed for its fine printing under the watchful eye of Stanley Morrison, the greatest authority on that subject of this century. And David's bookstall, the stall in the market where old Gustav David would set out the books he had bought cheap, and still priced cheap, every week. So it came about that I really can't remember a time when I was not hooked on old books. I still have the 1651 Elsevier Catullus that I bought when I was 10 from David for sixpence. It was a whole week's pocket money in those days. I can still remember the excitement of reading the first English encyclopedia, Bartholomew's Anglicus de Proprietatis Rerum, in English, I was not that precious, uh, but in the 1535 edition, printed by Thomas Bartlett, that my father took out of the library for me to read. In 1946, I went to school in London and spent my first half holiday scouring the Charing Cross Road. I went to Francis Edwards, is a great uh, emporium that specialized in travel and topography. I paid a visit to Quaritch's distinguished bookshop. And uh, if you want to know more about that, the book collector, I'll be coming to this, can tell you more. London led to a new enthusiasm. Much of it was still blitzed in those days. And at the end of the school garden, between it and the Houses of Parliament, was a small printing book works that had 
being struck by an incendiary bomb. Anything usable had been moved out of the shell, but there the remnants still stood, waiting for renovation or demolition, the punctured roof roughly covered with a tarpaulin that flapped in the wind. I discovered that if you climbed up a drain pipe and wriggled under the tarpaulin, you could still get in through the hole in the roof made by the bomb. So I got an elementary book on printing out of the library and some wire and ink from a handicraft shop and laboriously taught myself to set type in a warped and rusty composing stick and to print it on the one dilapidated old treadle pattern press that had obviously been left behind as not worth moving. I still blush when I look at my 13-year-old apprentice effort. I wonder how anybody could have been so blind to every canon of good printing and typographic taste. But better things were at hand. I went home that Christmas and asked my father for a printing press. He went to see Walter Lewis the university printer, and Lewis said, well, that's quite a coincidence. Michael Hornby has just asked me if I can find a good home for his father's press. Now, Michael Hornby was the son of St. John Hornby, the founder of the celebrated Ash and Dean Press. It was, in fact, even more of a coincidence than, than, than Lewis thought, because Michael Hornby had been one of my father's pupils. And so, before long, I was delightedly pulling on the bar of the old 1853 Hopkinson & Cope Royal Albion, one of the best hand presses I have ever set hands on. The Cambridge University Press provided type and advice, and slowly the quality of my work improved. By the time I got to Oxford as a student, I had become quite ambitious. The Duke of Wellington gave me an unpublished contemporary memoir of his great ancestor to print, and it was, by my standards, a runaway bestseller. I printed and sold a thousand copies and several of the papers that reviewed it were quite complimentary about its appearance. The last book I printed was Francis Cornford's last book of poems, 96 pages long, with illustrations in seven colours, and an edition of 1,500 copies. And don't, please let me advise you, do not attempt to print 1,500 copies of a book of 96 pages in seven colours. It took me two years. <laughs> and it was a bit of a fiasco because the ordinary edition at 15 shillings sold out very quickly but the limited edition which was to have been signed by the author fell through she died seven weeks before I printed the last sheet and there's another piece of advice always print the last sheet first and get the order found <laughs> still this brought me in touch with Geoffrey Keynes her cousin by marriage and I to owe to him and Tim Munby, the genial and generous librarian of King's College, Cambridge, my introduction to a wider circle afflicted with the same passion for books that I had. This, and I do apologize for this long digression, this brings me to the founding fathers of the book collector. John Hayward was and remained the most powerful, although a cripple, Multiple sclerosis had begun to set in while he was the brilliant undergraduate editor of the works of Rochester. And now confined to a wheelchair, he conducted business from a desk in a bay window overlooking the Thames on Cheney Row. Until recently, he had shared this flat with T.S. Eliot, whose muse and critic he had been during the writing of some of his best poetry. If you want to know more about this extraordinary association, I can't too strongly recommend Helen Gardner's fascinating and sympathetic account of it in her study of the four quartets. This had come to an abrupt end with Eliot's second marriage, and there was a new edge to John's always mordant command of those who came to him. Everyone did come to him. Printers came to have their proofs excoriated, Poets abided his merciless tongue for the quality of the creative criticism he provided. Librarians and book collectors came to listen to his fascinating and malicious gossip. No one could leave him without quailing at the thought of what John would say about them now behind their backs. None failed to come back for fear of what he would say if they did not. 
None of this gives any suggestion of the magnetism and charm of this extraordinary man who turned all his weakness into strength, his once handsome face now gargoyle, his legs immobile, only one arm moving, but that capable of still writing a beautiful hand. He dominated the early years of the book collector. Although two others, more able-bodied than John, were nominally editor one after the other, it was in fact John who took all the decisions chose the articles, rewrote and criticized so that hapless authors gave in from sheer exhaustion. He, whose magisterial comments on sales and exhibitions, institutional acquisitions and catalogues, gave the magazine a new and powerful authority in the world of old and rare books and manuscripts. At the same time, this editorial board was very much a team. Percy Muir was the eldest of the group. His education had stopped when he left school, after which he had been a clerk, an actor, and a soldier, only taking up bookselling by chance when demobilized in 1919. How he became a partner and eventually the owner of Elkin Matthews, that great name of the 90s, and then in the 20s and 30s, the most adventurous and scholarly of antiquarian booksellers, is a tale that he told in the pages of the book collector and subsequently reprinted in his autobiography, Minding My Own Business. Perhaps his most principal contribution to the book collector was not these articles and notes that he but, but the, the, the notes that he provided up to a, a month or two before his lamented death 15 years ago now, but his friendship with Ian Fleming. Now Ian Fleming's name will be familiar to you, but uh, in those days, before spectacular popular success and exploitation had overlain the real quality of his early writing, notably in Casino Royale. What you may not have known is that Ian Fleming was, and had been since before the war, a book collector of great determination and originality. His subject matter was the books that demonstrated the progress of the human mind since 1800. Nobody else was in the field. The books were not then expensive not even the origin of species, but they were hard to find. Fleming, working hard in naval intelligence during the war, and for, as foreign editor of Lord Kensley's Sunday Times after the war, did not have time to look for the books himself and made Percy Muir his agent. This was ideal for Percy too. Choosing the subjects and the books, we had filed away many bleak hours during the war, and after it, the more abstruse uh, uh, such, uh, foreign items such as that medical classic, Semmelweis's The Etiologie, which founded the modern science of immunology, were a, a, a splendid excuse to renew free pre war friendships in Italy and Germany, where he had a tremendous influence in patching over the wounds of war. So Fleming was ideally placed to rescue the book collector from its crisis in 1954. In that year, Lord Kemsley gave up books as suddenly as he'd taken them up in 1952. Fleming stepped into the, into the gap. He was just beginning to reap the rewards of the success of Casino Royale, and he felt he could offer to buy the book collector from Lord Kemsley for 100 pounds, which he did. It was at this moment that I first began to read the book collector regularly, and as I turn the pages now, I can still recapture the excitement that I felt when I first saw them. There was the admirable and still continuing series of books and notes, books and uh, uh, bibliographical notes and queries. There was uh, uh, Howard Nixon's English book bindings, now enshrined in a book and continued by Anderson, book collector. T.J. Brown's English literary auto autographs, the series of unfamiliar libraries from Manchester to Los Angeles, from Cashel in the west of Ireland to Erevan in what was then Soviet Georgia the series of contemporary collectors that describe the libraries of most of the great collectors of our time, Robert H. Taylor, Bradley Martin, Albert Ehrman, Major Abbey, while a portrait of a bibliophile ranged from Humphrey Duke of Gloucester in the 15th century to Charles de Spolbach from Lovenjul, the great collector of his French contemporaries in the 19th century. And above all, there was Uncollected Authors, a series of invaluable author bibliographies, beginning with John Hayward, assisted by his old friend, the subject of the piece, on Raymond Chandler.
I was, it was, I suppose, natural when I came up to London, Oxford over, to work in a publishing firm, I got gradually sucked into this vortex. The immediate cause was Stanley Morrison, the older and much admired friend of Carter, Muir and Hayward, who invited me in 1959 to be his research assistant, thereby setting me off on a course which led, finally, to the writing of Morris's, Morrison's autobiography and the finishing of his last great work, Politics and Script, a pilgrimage which brought me to the city for the first time in 1970. Immediately, however, I found myself doing odd reviews for the book collector, and then what caught John Hayward's attention was an article I wrote called The Aesthetic Investor's Guide to Current Literary Values, in which I attempted to prove that every author had a value, uh, mathematical or financial, it didn't matter which, you either put a differential sign or a pound sign or a dollar sign at the beginning of the equation, which could be worked out by correlating the original price of his works, the current price, the number of copies printed and now surviving, multiplied by the number of lines accorded to him in the Cambridge History of English Literature. <laughs> John Hay Hay Hayward was amused by this. It sent up both the book trade and the academic lit crit with impartial abandon. I read it myself the other day. They really, I, I thought it was quite funny, but I suppose I'm thank you. <laughs> and so I was admitted to the terrors and delights of tea at Carlisle Mansions. John's conversation was ribald, erudite, and riveting. I learned much and began to be less afraid. I even took our eldest child to see him. She was still crawling then, and John fed her very sticky chocolate cake and watched with cheerful malice in the hope that she would spread it on the T.S. Eliot manuscript <laughs> on the lower shelf. What I did not realize was that John, him immobile, had, become, had begun to become dependent on me. People used to say that he kept alive on willpower alone. With his terrible disabilities, you felt that it was the activity of the mind, the endless curiosity about other people, that forced his reluctant limbs to the little activity they could compass. He lived vicariously through the activity of others. And in 1965, it so happened that we had no holiday until October, when we were to snatch a bare week starting on a Friday. That day, John rang me up with some question about a review which I couldn't follow. He had no muscular control of his mouth by then, and this was apt to prolong his long telephone calls still further. In the end, I gave up. John, I said, I'm off on holiday today. I've got nothing else to do. I'll come and see you. So I went down to Cheney Mansions, and we sorted out the problem. I still didn't quite see what the problem was. And as I was going, he said to me, you will make sure everything is all right, won't you? I said, but John, you'll be here. You can look after it. Yes, he said, but I want to be sure that I, you will if anything goes wrong. I was puzzled by this insistence and said, of course I will. And I went off on holiday. That night he died. And three weeks later, I was at his memorial service in St. Luke's, Chelsea. A sinister posse, Muir, Carter and Monday, rounded me up after it. As I stood against the wall of the North Isle, I looked at them, their hats well pulled down, their hands deep in their overcoat pockets, and realized that there was no way out. And with John's last words echoing in my ears, I agreed to do my best to take his place. And somehow, 33 years later, we're still here. I still wonder at it. I was plunged immediately into a financial crisis. Ian Fleming had died shortly before John, and the cumulative effect of the tax on their two estates swallowed up all the book collectors' reserves. We survived that, and we survived the death three years later of our printer, James Shand of the Shenville Press. But the greatest of all the losses came in 1976, with the death of the kindest and closest of friends to the book collector and its editor, John Carter. Jake, as many knew him, was as distinguished in person as he was in mind. A scholar of King's College, Cambridge, he was for many years manager of Scribner's Rare Book Department, and as such made a host of friends in this country, 
and with his Savannah-born wife, Ernestine, made more as attaché of the British Embassy in Washington. We're nearly at the end, all right. And later in Sotheby's. Many, I dare say, in this audience were as proud as I am to number him among their friends. He only made one enemy, T.J. Wise, whose forgeries he exploded in the famous inquiry into the nature of certain 19th century pamphlets, published in 1934 and since republished with an extra volume of new material, which I am again proud to have contributed. As editor, he also co-opted me onto that great catalogue of all the world's greatest books, printing in the mind of man. And that's 35 years ago now. A great classical scholar Monke, his critical talents were displayed in his edition of Hausmann's prose. And a writer of great elegance himself, the ABC for Book Collectors is a perennial reminder of his, of his skill, now in its seventh or was it eighth edition. But of all his gifts, the one I treasure most was his encouragement of the young, notably myself. I miss his wit, his criticism, his help, and above all, his gaiety. Well, where do we stand now? The book collector now has about 1,500 subscribers, almost half of them in this country. Its contributors, the writers of articles and reviews, are also drawn equally from Britain and the United States of America. I like to think of its registered office, so to speak, as being in Atlantis. And the leader with which each issue begins, which I usually write myself, about some topic or book of current interest, is firmly aimed at both sides of the Atlantic. Then come the articles, which follow the same pattern as I've described. Then there is news and comment, which has all the latest news of books and libraries and exhibitions, book sales and catalogues, book collectors, booksellers, and librarians, the whole world of old and rare books. It's written by several hands, and it is topical, but careful, sometimes funny, and only scandalous if I know it is true. <coughs> After that, there is bibliographical notes and queries, an invaluable agony column for those who have made some small but important discovery that they want to get off their chest or want to run down some missing manuscript or edition, or have found some other bibliographical conundrum. After that come the book reviews, never, I hope, dull, and usually authoritative. And that makes up the text, except for one other important component, the advertisements. We take a personal pride in these, and see to it that the design and presentation is notably elegant. I like to think of them as a directory of all the best booksellers in Britain, the USA, and Europe. They, the advertisers, in turn get the best return for their loyal support, or so they tell me. And finally there is the cover. In the old days, when we were still printed by letterpress, it was printed on a different colored paper with each issue, with a border of printer's flowers in color running around the edge. Then this design got pirated by so many American bibliographical journals attached to major academic libraries that I felt some sort of change was called for. And so we moved on to reproducing, um, some would say abusing, early title pages. But there again, that didn't last too because other people started copying them. And so in more recent time, we've adopted a simpler and plain, but I hope still attractive format, and that's what it looks like now. We've also broadened our, uh, and, and, and branched out into book publishing. We've published two books, one called, uh, by, 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 both of them by, uh, by, well, one of them by Arthur Freeman and Janet Ing Freeman, the other by Janet Freeman alone. The first called Anatomy of an Auction, which is a highly and skillfully documented account of the ringing of a notorious auction sale in 1918. <coughs> the other is called 
the postmaster of Ipswich, and he's about the set of some of the most important English historical documents <coughs> and early English printed books from the great houses of Ham and Helmingham by a fellow who had, in his own mind, some right to what he stole. I will leave you by the book yourself and find out exactly what that conundrum means. And just uh, before Christmas last year, <coughs> We celebrated the, centi the 150th anniversary of Messrs. Quaritch, the famous booksellers, with a special issue, which, as I showed you earlier, has their name upon it. And that takes me back 50 years to when I first crossed the threshold of that firm. Well, at any rate, by hook or by crook, we are here. Book collectors, as such, have now become a closely studied species. Gone are the free days of the 50s. Rarely found outside wildlife parks, like book fairs, or reservations, like libraries. But somehow they survive, and so does the book collector. A new generation of subscribers and contributors is beginning to enjoy and renew the tradition that started all but 50 years ago. It is, I like to think, a distinctive and even admirable tradition, one that brings individuals and institutions, collectors, booksellers, and librarians a bit closer <coughs> together. I cannot but feel myself any more than a link in the chain. If I have given myself more space than that this evening, I'm sorry. But the journal itself is a better record of what it stands for than the chronicle of its editor. And if anybody feels disposed to find out more, please let me know. There are a few forms brought by our kind host this evening, who has, uh, which I can give to anybody who'd like to take one and fill it in. There's a copy or two which you may look at but not take away. <laughs> and thank you for listening to me with your usual generous patience. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Glenn? Uh, you've certainly made a number of wonderful characters come alive for us this evening, and I thank you for that. And I wonder if I might ask you to say another word or two about Mr. Munby, who is someone that I have a particular interest in. Ah, oh, well, Tim was pure gold all the way through. Uh, he, um, I'll tell you something about Tim. Before the war in the 30s, he had been a book scout for Sotheby's, and it was his job to go around the country in an old motor car uh, looking for books which people might sell at Sotheby's. And one day he'd gone to see a particularly hard-up, poor uh, family who had one possession and one possession only, which was a huge 15th or 16th century antiphona. It stood about four foot off the ground. It was written, you know, in huge letters uh, for an entire monastic community to sing from. And these things are as common as common can be. Their size and in this case their dilapidation made them totally unsaleable, but Tim, who, as I said, had a heart of gold, didn't have the heart to tell them it wasn't he promised to do his best, put it in the back of his car and said he decided back to London. About 30 miles out of London, the car broke down. Now these were long before the days when there was a garage on every corner, and also the motor car was a simpler article than it is nowadays, and most of us learnt to undergo, to, do, to perform elementary repairs on the scene. So Tim recognized what had happened. The cylinder had gas that had gone. So he looked at the antiphona, and he looked at the engine, and he thought, nobody will mind. So he whipped off the cylinder head, removed the gasket, laid it down on the ground, and with his pocket knife, cut out uh, a, a suitable oblong shape that holds to the right facing, and screwed the whole lot back together again, and merrily tooled off back to London. 
And people would say to him, that's a wonderful old car you've got there. How old is it? And he would say, parts of it date back to the 1570s. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>